Good evening, folks, and welcome to our community panel for the evening. My name is Cheryl Shank Miller, and I'm the Director of Enrollment Management at Eastside Prep. I am so glad you have joined us because you are going to get to hear directly from members of our school community about their experiences. This is our panel called In the Classroom Student and Teacher Stories, and we're grateful for the opportunity to just give you some really specific examples of what it means to be a community member, both in and sometimes outside of the classroom at EPS. So we're hoping that you'll have lots of great questions for us. You do have a Q&A feature. You can ask questions by letting us know who you are, or you can ask questions anonymously this evening, whichever you prefer. Uh, we will take questions through that chat function throughout the course of our program, the next hour and a half, and we look forward to responding either directly to you if you have a really specific question, or by posing that question to our panelists if it's something that is going to be relevant for a wide range of folks. So we will look forward to receiving those questions. But in the meantime, I want to make sure that you have a chance to get to know who our panelists are. Uh, so we're going to have a chance to meet our community members who are here this evening. And uh, we are joined by three students and three members of our faculty, including um, one member of our senior leadership team. And behind the scenes, in including myself, we also have Meg Blyler, who is our admissions event coordinator. And uh, we're grateful for her support of tonight's event and the communication around the event. So thank you, Meg, for making all of that happen. So we're going to go in order of this slide that you see here, and you'll have a chance to get to hear from each of these folks. They're going to introduce themselves. Students will introduce just their first name, um, then they will introduce their class year. And if that doesn't quite translate, because it takes a little bit of math to do some of those class year um, you know, sort of uh, leaps in your head, then they can tell you what grade they're in right now at EPS. For our faculty, they'll share how long they've been part of the EPS community as teachers, as well as um, really their depth of teaching experience before coming to EPS as far as how many years total they've been uh, an educator broadly. And then once we have that, we will roll into a variety of questions for them. Um, but I'm hopeful that in addition to their class year or number of years teaching, that folks can share just something that they're doing outside of the classroom at EPS. That could be a club or activity they're involved in, um, one that they sponsor or like to attend. Um, you could have a number of different things you share for that piece. So feel free to give us a variety of different uh, pieces of information just so that folks can get to know who you are and hopefully that will spur some specific questions from them. So with that said, uh, James, you are first on the list as our oldest member of the student panel class of 2023. James, how are you this evening? Hello, I am doing great. Yeah, so I'm James. I'm a member of the class of 2023, so that means that um, I'm a current junior at Eastside Prep. Awesome. And James, you want to tell us some things that you do outside of the classroom? Yeah, so um, I at Eastside Prep, I obviously I love learning and I love the different subjects offered here. So some of my favorites are chemistry and, you know, I enjoy all of the, all the history classes that we can take. But outside of school, um, I'm, a, I'm a mountain biker and so I do that competitively um, and I also play soccer. So, yeah. Great. Awesome, James. Thanks so much for being here. Lorenzo. Hello, uh, so I'm Lorenzo. I'm in the class of 2024, so I'm a 10th grader right now at Eastside Prep. And then awesome. uh, some of the, yeah, some of the stuff that I enjoy doing outside of the classroom would be I'm a avid sports player from basketball, frisbee, soccer. I enjoy all three of those things, which are all at Eastside Prep. And then I also like to do some podcasts in my free time with some of my friends. So that's some of the stuff that I really enjoy. Nice. Thanks for joining us, Lorenzo. And then Elena from the middle school. Hello, I'm Elena. I'm the only middle schooler here. Um, I am in sixth grade, class of 2028. And um, outside of school, I like to swim. I like to also draw. I'm currently working on a picture with my friends. I'm, one of my teachers that is looking very funny and interesting. <laughs> Any teacher in particular? Um, the teacher is my history teacher. 
Okay. All right. Well, I now I'm feeling very interested to see this drawing once you all have it done. So keep me posted, Elena. And thanks for sharing that. And now we'll introduce our faculty, Katie Dodd. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Katie Dodd. Um, I teach science in our middle school and our upper school. This is um, my 13th year at Eastside Prep. Wow, um, <laughs> clearly I like it. I'm sticking around, right? In fact, I love it. In fact, liking it is an understatement. Um, my teaching before here, most of my teaching has happened at Eastside Prep. Um, I did teach a little bit um, at some other private schools in the area, as well as um, when I was in graduate school, but, but the vast majority of my teaching career um, has happened here, um, teaching classes to sixth graders, seventh graders, eighth graders, and then some upper school electives. So it's really fun to, to have been able to work with a, a wide range uh, of our student body over the years. Let's see, and then I'm supposed to talk about outside of the classroom stuff, right? Right. Okay. Um, so done a lot of things over the years, um, ranging from um, an origami club that used to happen with some fifth grade uh, boys after school way back in the day. Um, I've been able to help with the middle school volleyball. Um, I've helped with the Lego robotics team um, and my big thing now, it's its perhaps maybe the, the least exciting of these clubs, but um, I am the proud sponsor of the Homework Club, uh, which <laughs> is a place where um, some students like to, to come in the middle band if they're just feeling like they've got some work to do, and so they, they just want a place where they can kind of have a quiet spot to work. So maybe not the most exciting, but definitely um, a valuable thing to offer. A great opportunity for those who are looking to take advantage of it. Well, thanks so much, Ms. Dodd, for joining us this evening. Alicia Hale. Hi, everyone. I teach historical thinking and literary thinking in the middle school. Um, I teach seventh grade um, history and one section of sixth grade lit. Um, and I have been at Eastside Prep for four years. I think at this point, but mm -hmm. prior to that, I taught um, at a high school. Um, I taught advanced placement in the high school for 10 years, and then I taught some middle school prior to that, so I've been teaching for quite a long time. Um, and outside of teaching, I have sponsored multiple clubs. I'm, teaching, I'm sponsoring the Creative Writing Club um, this trimester. Um, I have uh, sponsored the Civic Engagement Club, I'm also a co-sponsor. Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm the co-sponsor. Sorry, that was all of last year. Um, uh, the co-sponsor of the Breaking the Binary Club. Um, so uh, I I have a lot of opportunities to hang out with um, students in different um, methods, um, and it's been fantastic. And then outside of EPS, um, I am a baker. Um, obviously, I own a cat, um, and um, I do um, some fiber arts. Nice. And we've had multiple pets try to make cameos during our community panels over the past couple of years. So um, Ms. Hale, well, should should you wish to, please feel free to introduce your cat. Any other uh, pets that join us, you can feel free to introduce anyone. This is, uh, this is Chick Chick. She's very Chick -chick. old and very senile and um, enjoyed being in class um, every day all of last year. You know, lifelong yeah. learning, that's something that we're all about here at EPS. So I'm grateful that Chick Chick is with us to, to take part. And finally, last but not least, Sam Uswak. Uh, good evening. My name is Sam Uswak. I'm the Associate Head of School for Middle School and Student Support Services. Alicia, I have not seen your cat in a while, so it's uh, it's nice to see Chick Chick again. I started the same year as Katie Dodd. We came in together 13 years ago or so, uh, and like her, I love it here. Prior to that, I taught at the Northwest School. I taught humanities over on Capitol Hill for seven years. And before that, I was in an uh, Arctic in Yupak Village for a couple of years. That was my first teaching gig. Uh, I am the proud sponsor of our eighth grade leadership lab this year, uh, which is a group of 18 students. It's a, it's a group who wants to uh, contribute to the life of the middle school, work on some projects, but learn about their leadership styles and other folks' leadership styles as we do that. So really excited to have a great crew of enthusiastic kiddos this year. Woohoo, Leadership Lab. Well, very exciting stuff. Thanks so much, everyone, for taking the time to introduce yourselves and some of the ways that you're engaged both in and outside of the classroom at Eastside Prep. Um, and I want to kick us off with a question about 
how we structure our schedule here at EPS because we have a schedule that involves four classes on one day, four classes on the following day. Um, so when we're talking about being in the classroom, we have these 70 minute class blocks and we have a question that came through. Uh, I know EPS has longer class blocks. Interested to hear how teachers structure classes and break it up to help students stay engaged. So when thinking about this question, teachers, I'm curious if you have any specific examples of uh, you know some ways that you even just today varied a 70 minute block uh, for the benefit of student learning and engagement and students I'm curious if you can speak to how um, that has worked on your end so if folks want to unmute um, on their end I will I will just as folks are um, willing to speak I will call on those who are unmuted um, but I'm hoping that Ms. Hale or Ms. Dodd can help with um, something to start so go ahead Katie all right, yeah, so um, I, so I've been at DPS for many years, as I said, and we've had a, a whole host of schedules, right, the, in the time that I've been here, um, but I have, have really come to appreciate these longer block classes, right? Um, honestly, partly from the, the selfishness of the teacher perspective, right, as a science teacher, I can do longer experiments, right? It gives me the, the space to set up things that need more setup, that need more explanation for students to, to gather more data, do something more complicated. Um, so, so just in terms of what I get to do, um, that they're really wonderful, but something that also I, I really value about them is um, a while back I was able to attend um, a learning in the brain conference um, that talked about uh, student brains and it was really interesting. Um, it talked about how transitions between classes are hugely energetically costly for kids, right, in terms of kind of changing their mindsets. Um, and so I really, it was an aspect of the value of block classes that I, that I hadn't thought about before and that it, it makes it, that the kids don't feel like they're kind of zooming from thing to thing to thing to thing, right? There's kind of fewer things to focus on um, and those tr transitions help them um, kind of stay within a content. But then we do kind of as, um, Ms. Shank Miller said we do vary the activities within the classroom during that time, right? So they're not sitting in place, you know, listening to a teacher for 70 minutes, right? There might be, um, uh, in science anyway, we might um, talk about a lab for a little bit. They might go gather some data. They might then work with a partner to analyze the data, work on some questions, right? Um, check in with me about things. So there's a lot of um, movement opportunities and kind of um, diversity of activities within those 70 minute blocks, but you're still able to kind of do those deeper dives, um, which I think is, is so valuable. Mm. So one of the things I'm hearing from you is it's good for the brain to minimize transitions between really different areas of learning and not have those be too frequent, but it's also great to have transitions within a discipline or within a subject or within a class that would involve breaks for movement and just kind of mixing it up from student to student or from kind of, you know, uh, activity to activity. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. And that was just something that was so interesting to me because I, I hadn't learned that before, right? But in this conference that talked about sort of brain functionality, it was a real eye opener for me when, when the, that information was presented that way. Awesome. Alicia, what would you share? Um, I think that I'm going to kind of obviously layer on top of what Katie is talking about because I think that one thing that we happened today was we were creating a rubric as a class uh, to score something that they had created. So students had the opportunity to work in different modalities to look at um, aspects of a rubric, what should go on the rubric, what was fair for everyone. Um, and so there were small group discussions, there were discussions going on, on the whiteboard, um, and then we were kind of rotating around to kind of think about all the different ways we could um, like make sure everyone had um, a fair way to grade each other um, with this thing that we had created. Um, and I think that um, having that space um, and kind of that deep breath to kind of dig into something is really great for students to realize that we're not rushed. We can take the time to dig into this and that we should have the space to kind of figure out where we all sit with it. Um, and we all came to a really great um, kind of ending point where we had three good points that we felt were fair um, grading aspects that we wanted to put on our rubric as a class, which is really, really fantastic to see, but also I didn't feel like anyone was panicked about the process because everyone got a chance to like process in the way that they felt was um, the most meaningful. So one of the things I'm hearing from you is that you know really having these blocks and having the variety of activities that can happen within it 
we'll also provide some space for different types of brains to chew on things differently. So it's like everyone's going to have a, a little bit of a different experience, but when you don't have to have this pressure of time looming over you the entire block like uh, or the entire class period, like, oh, this is, this is just going to rush right by, um, you might be able to get into things differently than if you have a shorter block and it's preferencing maybe certain types of learners who would be predisposed to be able to maybe make those faster mental transitions or speak um, more freely in a large group versus those who might need a lot more warm up time. Yeah, absolutely. And just the space to maybe go walk across the classroom and talk with a friend that you trust. That is really a nice space to be like, it's okay to walk across the room, like to go talk to them because we were in this big learning environment at the time and it was fine. And I really love to see those students be like, well, I'm sitting over here, but I need to go talk to so-and-so. I'm like, oh yeah, totally. Like go check in with them. What do you think they think of, of what we're working on? Um, and uh, just having that freedom, uh, not only for movement, but also for uh, trying to figure out that metacognitive moment of like, how am I going to figure this out best? Mm -hmm. Cause that's like, that's the skill that endures beyond the class itself. <laughs> when students are able to figure out how am I going to figure this out best? And they're not just going from one thing that's dictated to them to another, but they have to use some of that metacognition to use that big word that you just employed, Ms. Hale, um, or just that thinking about thinking, um, kind of having their own analysis of their own learning process is something that we really hope students will take out of the EPS experience. So students, I'm hopeful that you can share maybe just from today, like what was a block that you had that you enjoyed today and what were some of the different activities that you did within it or maybe from the past couple of days because obviously we've got four classes on one day four classes on the following day or the previous day so um feel free to share something that you feel like is representative of, of how we do learning here at eps lorenzo yeah um so i think first coming into the school one of my concerns with the biggest class was oh it wouldn't be interactive and because not everyone learns the same it would be hard for me to get into it. But right away, one of the things I saw was that all different types of learners are catered in this uh, in these class periods because teachers try to do a visual aspect. They talk for a bit. They have you work in groups and all these different things that they do is really helpful for people who don't learn quite the same, which I really appreciated right away. An example of that would be today in history. Um, we had a so we read some sources. We listened to our teacher, Mr. Bandel, Bandel talked for a little bit, and then we would make a PowerPoint with friends to then present to the class. So we're kind of learning from each other as well. And I think that's like one of the most appealing things from these schedules is that you have that time, but it's not just like listening to a teacher for this long, which again is still really fun, but they change it so that we're learning from each other and we're adapting off each other. And we're also doing different forms of learning, which really, really helps because it would seem like it's a long time, like a 70 minute block, but it's like sometimes it just goes by like 10 seconds. It's like mm -hmm. super, super fast, but you're still getting all that knowledge and learning from it. So it's really, really, from a student's perspective, I appreciate a lot from that angle. Awesome, awesome. Lorenzo, can you actually ground us in, in that example of what you all did for that history PowerPoint today? I'd love to hear uh, what you and your classmates worked on, or maybe like an example of another PowerPoint that somebody in your class did as well. Sure. Uh, so the thing that we were learning today was we're in medieval literature and we're learning about the high Middle Ages right now. So we took a deep dive into women's role in society during that time period and how it changed from the early Middle Ages into that late Middle Ages period. So we were tasked with different sources showing art from that time period, literature from that time period, and all were all like a lot of different sources. So then we could use that information and then present back to the class and show from a different perspective because each class got different or each group got different sources. So then we can see overall throughout different areas in Europe mainly um, that we could report back their role in that time period and how it evolved. Awesome. That's a really helpful thing to have rooted in example. James, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I was just wanting to kind of also just touch on our class schedule. I think the way that it's structured right now is really great and it promotes um, you, you can really get into a class period, but it's not so much whereas you you feel like you're on one ta on one task and one subject um, for for too long. Um, and so we basically at ESA prep, we have eight class eight class period blocks um, and then they're given a letter A through H. 
Um, and then four, we'll have four of those class period blocks per day, and then they will rotate. So what, one day might be an A through D day, and another day might be a D through A, or an H through an E day. And so just depending on that, we'll have different classes at different times. And that's really great because then you might not get stuck with a certain class always, you know, in the morning because maybe, you know, you're not so fresh in the morning as you are in the afternoon. And so that's really beneficial for a lot of people, including myself, because it allows you to mix things up and to and to have classes when you're able to learn um, that. And I, I also, a great thing about Eastside Prep is the electives and being able to take during different classes during um, during the day and have different fields um, of subjects. And so I always try and take at least one art class um, per trimester. And so like, for example, right now I'm in graphic design and graphic design is it's great because it's an opportunity to do something more creative and artistic during the day, even though my, um, today was an A through, yeah, today was an A through D day, even though my A through D day is more STEM focused. Um, and, and I also just wanted to mention something that I failed to mention um, when we were talking about activities that we do um, outside of school. So I also am a member of the FTC robotics team at ESAP Prep. So if anybody has any questions about that, I'm happy to answer those. And I also help run a small tutoring company with one of my friends from EPS. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, James, uh, James, thanks for all that context uh, and you know explanation about kind of how that schedule works practically, because I think that helps fill out more details for the folks that are in the audience. And we actually have a specific question. Um, speaking of giving highly specific information, we have a highly specific question for Ms. Hale um, regarding sixth grade lit. So what books and topics are included? Um, Carrie, who's Finn's mom, would like to know. And uh, I think this is a great way of getting evidence of within our literary thinking curriculum, um, what some of the variety of that can be within a middle school course. So go ahead, Alicia. Awesome question. So we are um, we do a genre study in sixth grade and we just finished our nonfiction unit, which was super fun. Um, and we actually did kind of some autobiographical and opinion writing for our um, nonfiction section. And then we are going into historical fiction, which um, and then we will be going into myth um, and some folk tales. Um, then we're going to be doing a poetry unit. We're going to be looking at some novels and verse. Um, and then we'll be doing uh, some short story units. Um, and so we definitely look at different genres. And the, the historical fiction book um, this year is One Crazy Summer, but it does shift from year to year depending on um, how we are going to dive into historical fiction um, because there's constantly new books coming out. So we don't tend to have, the, the book list does tend to shift depending on what's kind of being published or what Miss Mills and I have read. Um, and we do um, change things up. So we're adding novels in verse this year to our poetry unit, which we're really excited about. Um, we read a bunch of uh, novels in verse over the summer, which was really fun. Nice and good to hear about the variety there. I know in my own educational experience, I felt like a lot of the books that were taught were the same books that had been taught the year before and the year before that. And I'm hearing fresh content uh, that you delved into over the summertime. So um, so great to hear about the variety of different sources that you're pulling in, um, in addition to the variety of different genres. And a quick question along those lines, which is, um, do we use hard copy textbooks or solely online content? Um, someone wants to know. Oh, well, this is definitely relevant for I can answer for history and I can answer for lit. So um, lit, we are doing hard copy um, books um, just because it's going to um, mean we all have the book at the same pace. And sometimes sometimes the Kindle version can be different um, than a hard copy. So we have class sets of those. Um, so we do use some online. I think in sixth grade, we're usually mostly hard copy, um, but we do a lot of um, like a lot of our short stories online. Um, and some of our poetry is online. Um, for history, we use uh, the Washington State textbook is online. Um, and then we have other supplemental texts that are hard copy. Um, and then um, I will supplement with historical documents um, and historical collections that are online that I will curate for students. 
Awesome. And I'm hearing about, about first, you know, these first person sources, historical sources and documents. So not just things in a textbook, not just things that are compiled by folks who have deemed them to be important to include in a compilation, but also things that um, have been individually curated by teachers. And then, you know, hearing Lorenzo talk about working with some of those in this um, in this class that he was mentioning earlier. It's, it's great to know that not only are we talking about some of these things that are going to be published um, and in books uh, and in textbooks, perhaps, but also a variety of different other individual sources that might be um, things that the faculty members are seeking out. Elena, we have you back with us and um, I ooh, and with a brand new background that also looks scrumptious like the donuts before. Um, Elena, was there anything that you wanted to share regarding that previous question as far as use of a block, um, something that you're doing either maybe within a class that you had today or within a class recently, just giving examples of how that 70 minute block is used from your ex experience. Um, yeah, sorry, just um, my computer just shut down. Um, so, well, yesterday mm -hmm. we, um, so the teachers, they get along really well and um, they have like a big source of imagination for kids to interact and when they need to interact, they interact. When they um, are learning, they study really hard. So yesterday we started to like we went on a field trip in the afternoon, but then in the like morning part in one of the periods, um, we we went to um, like play these games that interacted with each other. So like yesterday was pretty much just like an interaction period for us um, and that was really helpful. But then like other days we have like we study hard, I guess, and then we do lab experiments, we do like a bunch of fun stuff. So I'm hearing a lot of variety from you, much like the sprinkles on the cupcake behind you, uh, you know, all sorts of different shades of different things that we're engaged in. Um, and we actually have a follow up question, I believe, to um, what Ms. Hale was sharing, um, which is how much time is spent diving into the different genres of writing? And um, Alicia, you can probably speak to that with some knowledge of a discipline perspective, not just from your own coursework, but um, we do work within, instead of calling them departments or offices at EPS, we call these are different academic disciplines that we're engaged in, such as social science, literature, um, and, uh, and our natural sciences as well would be included in that. So um, Alicia, can you speak specifically about those different genres of writing and how much you're diving into them? Um, obviously, um, as much as we would love to dive into, say, historical fiction for months on end, we, we absolutely don't have the time. Um, but a lot of it is giving students the ability to read a genre and understand the aspects of that genre. So when we read them again, we can recognize those aspects and think about how the author is using the genre to um, get their point across, um, and also maybe the, the reasons those genres exist. So obviously the, the reason for uh, historical fiction and, and um, how it's used and how it's read and why it's read is different than folk tale and myth, um, and how those things weave together um, to, and, and obviously we're not even touching on every genre of literature um, in the sixth grade, um, curriculum, but obviously giving the students a way to um, start looking at literature um, as um, a genre study. That there are so many different ways for literature to exist is something that it's that's kind of where we're going with sixth grade. Um, and we do work closely with our historical um, thinking teacher in sixth grade um, so we can layer on some of the ideas like just with the historical fiction unit that we're coming into. We actually um, sat down and talked to Mr. Winkleman about how we can use um, the units that he was just um, developing and working with students on Chinese immigration um, to discuss um, the setting of the book um, One Crazy Summer, which is in Chinatown in 1968 um, in San Francisco. So finding a way to kind of layer um, that literature thinking, literary thinking as on top of some of the themes that are happening in history as well. Mm. Super, super helpful. And um, since we heard about some of this work in different writing genres, uh, I'm going to pose a question to Ms. Dodd. 
specific to the science curriculum, scientific, scientific thinking. So for science in fifth and sixth grade, what percentage of learning goes toward practical experiments versus learning theory during the course of the year? So I'm, I'm curious if you can talk about that balance of theory and practice throughout the science curriculum. Yeah, sure, definitely. Um, I think that's exactly it, that, there, that there's a balance involved here, right? And I think um, one thing that the, the science teachers kind of in, in general try to do at EPS is really, um, you know, facilitate the classes in a way that allows students um, in, in many cases to, to kind of through inquiry be the ones to discover this information, right? So, you know, there's going to be some things where there's maybe more direct instruction, right? Oh, we're telling you about this, telling you about that, but there's a lot of things that are, are designed in a way for, you know, students to, to gather data, right? To, to do something to gather data and then by, by looking at that data to start to have an understanding of that process, right? So kind of helping them connect the dots in some ways. So, um, for example, in, in seventh grade, um, we just recently um, finished um, an egg osmosis lab, kind of a classic uh, middle school science lab um, where students are, are putting eggs that they've removed the shells from and they're they're putting them in different substances and they you know read and talked a little bit about osmosis prior to that then they had to generate hypotheses about what they thought would happen right when they put the eggs in different solutions and in many cases it was not what the students had predicted right mm -hmm. and at first for some of them that's a little disconcerting they kind of go oh no i got it wrong and you say okay but no let's hold on let's talk about this right so what happened then why did this happen and it gets them to kind of grapple with the information um, more directly, right? And to start to think about how do I see this in my data, right? How can I start to, to make these connections? And so I think, you know, we're, we're always looking for ways to kind of bring those things together, right? Um, and, and finding that balance and, you know, hands-on is it's so nice to be back in person to do so much more <laughs> hands-on stuff, right? Um, because that's really, you know, something we strive for is to have a, a lot of experiences with labs and working you know, depending on the year, working with different types of equipment. My students spent some time working with microscopes at the beginning of the year um, and just kind of building science skills, um, it, both in terms of equipment, but also in terms of kind of the way we think about things. Right. So again, scientific thinking, right, thinking mm -hmm. uh, middle school specifically. Awesome. And so one of the things I'm hearing there, too, is this is starting with some inquiry and really encouraging students to be using inquiry, using curiosity to access some of this learning rather than just handing them the content and saying, this is how osmosis works. Now take a test about it. Have a, have a nice day. Um, but that it's really about having those experiences where that inquiry transforms from just one's curiosities into like this is this is where you're really applying it and relating it to maybe some of the content that was introduced. Um, which I think that that um, is really something that we get a lot of feedback from students on as being an exciting part of the EPS experience that they get to ask these big questions that they get to do things. So students, um, some from science specifically, because um, I know each one of you is enrolled in a different science class right now. Can you give a recent example of something that you did, you know, learning by doing and maybe how it related to something that you were learning about from a theory perspective. Maybe it was a law of physics or maybe it was some uh, component of how things work in chemistry or maybe it was something, you know, just broadly from how we use hypotheses in science. So, um, Lorenzo, what would you share in terms of this idea of how we do school at EPS um, through experiences? Well, I just first of all want to say like, right when Miss Dodd was talking about that lab, I immediately remembered it because it felt like it was just yesterday, even though it was so long ago. Yes, and yes. <laughs> yeah, it was, I remember that lab so clearly, but the thing that I remember more than just the lab itself is like the other day in chemistry, we had to do a lab where we basically worked with uh, the, the percentage of cobalt within the soil that we were analyzing for these cows. And obviously it's like not real cows, but they, they gave us these, these soil samples and we have to analyze the, absorbance level and concentration of cobalt chloride within these samples and right away i was like okay never really done this before something new to me and dr allow our teacher kind of just put us out into this lab and we had to do it and our results although we're close to the right answer we're not exactly exactly right because the ideal slope for the percentage of cobalt would be around one and we were everyone was kind of around from like a 0 0.8 to 0 0.9 ratio which is close 
but the thing that we learn most from that is that like we got things wrong but then afterwards he spent a lot of time making sure we all knew what was wrong and what we did wrong and how we could fix that rather than just getting it wrong and then we all had to do our revised letter back to the lab which everyone scored a lot higher on because of the fact that he spent so much time giving us that experience of yes failure doesn't feel great in the moment but it's how you build from that that the teachers really help you with that that sticks with you just like from sixth grade when we learn those things there the fundamentals carry on through your entire time at EPS and like again like Miss Hale was saying too like with the literature all these classes like those things that you start with in the young age you might be like oh when am I going to use this again and then right away when you're high school and years after it's like okay this is something I need to know and you learn it from a young age so it's really helpful from the get-go. Awesome. That Those are both really great um, examples to hear from your perspective, Lorenzo. And yeah, I'm glad to hear that that egg lab kindled some fond memories for you too. Um, James, what would you like to add in terms of maybe a science specific example or some other examples of this experience based learning? Yeah, so I think I'm currently taking uh, advanced chemistry. And so I think it's just uh, I can provide some perspective on what how this is implemented in one of the advanced classes at Eastside Prep. Um, and so just today, for example, I'm doing a lab. We're doing a lab on finding um, how quickly on finding the rate of reaction between bleach and food coloring. And so what we were just done is we and what so what happened is we were given materials on how much bleach, um, how much bleach were allowed and how much food coloring were allowed and we were given and we're and we've been given six class periods to go out and figure out how to determine the rate of reaction between bleach and food coloring. And so the kind of whole ethos of the experiment has been that mistakes are OK and that we're able to make mistakes and then just learn from those mistakes and then implement them the next day until on the final day where we'll hopefully have a a complete procedure and we'll know how to find the concentration or, or the rate of reaction between the bleach and food coloring and then we'll give a small presentation to our peers on that and so I think that's really um, really demonstrative of the way that learning happens at EPS and it's very it's very hands-on it's learning by doing and learning by experiencing things which I think is really great. I'm also hearing from you about, you know, kind of being given some constraints about both the materials that you're working with and the time that you have. So it's not like you have just unlimited time and materials to work with, but you know that within the scope of what you're given, um, what the task is before you. And that very much sounds like the way that uh, a lot of folks will encounter things in the world of work, um, whatever that may be for them. So um, sounds pretty relevant. And then Elena, what, is there anything you'd like to add as an example from scientific thinking? Um, and maybe it'll kindle some more fond memories for uh, folks like Lorenzo and James. Um, well, uh, currently we're doing droplets. So we're doing, so we get four um, of these mysterious bottles of liquids mm -hmm. and one of them is water that we know of and the other ones are shaped um well there's food coloring in them so they're different colors and then we are trying to figure out um what type which one is water from um the drops they make compared to water so um yeah and someone asked what percent of learning goes through practical experiments right yes learning theory um, I would say in fifth grade, you, well, since fifth grade for me was online, we didn't really do much experimenting, but I would say that it was mostly learning theory in fifth grade, but now in sixth grade, we are usually doing hands-on and we're learning. Mm, well, I'll say that like most of our theory that we learned was from fifth grade and now we're doing hands-on like practical experiments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a big transformation, and I know that the teachers worked hard to put lab kits together, but even with some great supplies that we were able to send home with students, it's just not the same as being in the classroom. Um, so, Elaine, it's great to hear that you have had the experience to, of being more hands-on with things um, and using that base of theory that you were able to gain more readily in um, fifth grade last year. Um, Mr. Yu, I want to pose a, a question to you, which is really about kind of the arc of the academic experience overall. 
because we have a question uh, really around how our curriculum is going to maybe follow or exceed or compare with a, a public district curriculum. Um, and so, you know, thinking about this arc of the middle school and how our courses are structured in the middle school. And I know you're familiar with the high school program having done especially college counseling on behalf of EPS before and what these different graduation requirements are. Um, can you talk a little bit about kind of this preparation broadly as far as um, the, the structure of curriculum uh, in a big picture way? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, it's an important question. Um, well, we are, we of course follow our state guidelines for graduation requirements, as does Bellevue and everyone else. So um, we are in line in that manner. Um, where we differ from the larger public schools, though, is that we are um, we're mission driven to be college and life preparatory. All of our classes are college preparatory classes within the high school and in our middle school, our job is to prepare students to be successful in our upper school. Uh, we uh, in Bellevue School District, Lake Washington, you will hear words in terms like advanced placement, AP, International Baccalaureate, IB, um, and those are off the shelf curricula that allow a, a much larger district to um, uh, distinguish students that are in a much broader band of students than uh, Eastside Preparatory School. Um, so we don't have AP and we don't have a IB, but we do have science, math, <laughs> humanities, mm -hmm. arts, PE. Um, we have, and the reason that we don't use those curricula is because we want to be able to write our own. What's wonderful about working at Eastside Prep in the middle and upper school is our teachers are not just teachers, they are curriculum generators. Mm. They are creators of experience. Um, and we want to have the independence uh, and the agency to do it in a way we feel is relevant, is modern, is innovative, and is always pushing at the edge. Mm. So I'm hearing a couple of differentiators uh, already then in terms of EPS and maybe some other forms of education. What are some other folks that folks, uh, what are some other things that folks would add in terms of differentiating EPS from either other high schools or just other school programs broadly? And, and just speaking from your personal experience, this is not to make a, a point of comparison with other schools, um, but really in your own school experience, like what, what have you found has made EPS different? Lorenzo, what would you like to share? Uh, the academic side of things has been super helpful for me. And that goes without saying I've enjoyed my time here. I've been here for a long time since I was in fifth grade. But I think the thing that really stands out is the community because from day one, that's been the thing that's been like the most outstanding part of our school is that not only do the teachers care about educating you, but they care about who you are as a person. They care about your growth. And I think that I've grown to become more responsible I've learned kindness, I've learned communication, self-advocacy is huge in our school. And not only the community from the teachers, but the students around you. I mean, I've had built a great group of friends. There's so many nice, nice people at our school. The teachers, again, just want to reinforce that. Like they really go above and beyond, not only to just care about teaching you, but they'll ask about how you are. They'll go in detail, make sure that you're really okay and make sure that to help you the best that they can. So I think that the community for me is what really like stands out above everything else. Academics right also there, right behind that. Like we have really, really good teachers who teach really fun, interesting and good concepts, but it's paired with that academic side that's paired with the compassionate and community aspect we have at the school, which I think is just excellent, yeah. Awesome, super appreciate hearing what a great experience you've had over a number of years, Lorenzo, with yes, what's happening in the classroom, but so much of the learning that's happening um, through community as well. Um, Elena, is there anything that you'd like to add in terms of um, that, that question? Um, well, I think, yeah, I agree with Lorenzo. It's the EPS community that usually stands out. Um, for example, last year, um, in July, uh, I found the new kids' names and all that stuff that were coming into sixth grade. And then we made 
me and the rest of the previous fifth graders made um, welcome chats for them so that they would feel welcomed and all that stuff and know us and yeah. Awesome. So even in an online school environment, taking that opportunity through making some welcome chats to include folks and um, make them feel like a part of things, because we do have 36 fifth graders in the EPS program, and then we'll add to that another 18 sixth graders every year. So a lot of times folks ask, you know, how do you integrate these students or when you have ninth graders that are joining those who have come up from eighth grade, how do you connect one another? And a lot of times we'll talk about the initiatives that we do as a school in terms of grade level picnics and fall orientations and advisory programs and having a mix of new and returning students in advisory. But when I hear from students about things that they of their own volition have done to connect to one another, um, that to me is a great indicator of um, the health and strength of our community. James, what would you add? Sorry, my team's froze there for a sec. Um, <laughs> I think something that I would just really like to add um, is uh, I would just like to place some emphasis on those teacher-student relationships that Lorenzo touched on before. Um, the relationships with the teachers and the students, I think, is the most powerful part of, e of the EPS experience. Um, when you're interacting with the teacher, it's not a purely transactional experience. You're not, they're not just there to give you learning. Um, they're there to help teach you and to guide you and to help you grow as a person. And they always take a vested interest in you and who you are and how you're doing. And I think that is that's re that's really amazing. I think that's one of the things that I appreciate the most about the EPS experience. And not only that, but the academics at EPS is quite rigorous. And so for anyone who enjoys being challenged and stimulated and who enjoys learning, I think EPS is a great place for them. I've quite enjoyed being able to take classes and I've, and I've enjoyed being able to push myself and to excel in those classes. I touched on before that I'm taking advanced chemistry um, and part of the and the course, while it's not an AP course, um, a lot of the material that we are learning is AP based. And I definitely noticed how um, how our teacher is helping us for those of us who want to take the AP chemistry test um, in terms of the way that she's testing us. Um, she is helping us prepare for that. And so there's a lot of there's just a lot of life preparation built into all of the classes at EPS. Yeah. Mm. James, uh, there's that's actually a great segue into a question that we were just asked, which is um, to specifically have Lorenzo and you talk about the, the homework load for some of these advanced classes and classes in general in the high school. Um, also wanting to hear about how you're balancing that out with after school sports or club commitments, like in your case, robotics um, and, you know, bedtime. Can, can we be brutally honest about what that looks like? how much sleep you're getting. We, um, one thing I'll note before we have our students talk about that is that we have our school day now starting at 8.30. That is something that we um, made an adjustment for in our schedule, intent to, intentionally trying to give students more of that time in their teenage brains to rest, because we know how essential that is for their development. So, um, so 8.30, revised from eight o'clock, which was our previous start time. So with that said, um, James, can you talk about that kind of homework load and what that looks like and how you're balancing that with different commitments you have? So yeah, so I think e the EPS workload, it's definitely very variable based on the classes that you take, especially in the upper school when you have opportunities to take advanced classes. I think advanced chemistry at the moment for me is about 60% of my workload. And so that's quite a challenge um, to take on. But the workload at EPS, while it's a lot, it's not unmanageable. And I think a powerful part of that is that it helps teach you time management and it kind of forces you to need to self-advocate and to come to your teachers and, to, and when you need help to go, hey, I need help with this. Can you please help me out? And the teachers are always willing to help you. They're regular office hour times office hours times that are scheduled so that you can have those interactions with teachers. They're always willing to help you out. Scheduled meetings um, if you need to do something like a lab after school. I stayed after school for a while and I finished up my lab and that was great. And so EPS, I, I would say I get about eight hours of sleep a night, which is a pretty good amount. And, oh, and a great part about the upper school, um, when you start getting free periods, then, it, and also when you start driving or when you have a parent drive you, um, I've started driving and so I was able to 
get sleep in and um, drive myself to school. So I slept from like 1030 to nine last night, which was pretty darn great. And so I'm just the way that EPS works is you're able to um, you're able to get an appropriate sleep amount. And I did have my extracurriculars yesterday. Um, and so I'll have robotics tomorrow and the day after. And so it's not unmanageable. And I know many people who one of my friends, he does five hours of gymnastics a day um, and he's still able to incorporate his workload. And so while it is, it is a lot of work, it's not unmanageable. Um, and James, while I have you here, can you just talk really quickly about one of your robotics projects? That was another question that we got to. Yeah, sure. So I think I've I've really enjoyed robotics. Oh, yeah, there we go. I've really enjoyed robotics at EPS. I've it's been one of my favorite parts of the whole experience. Um, we do FTC robotics, and um, that stands for F First Tech Challenge. Um, and so basically, the way that it works is every year a new challenge will come out and you need to construct a robot to solve said challenge. Um, it's last year it was throwing rings through um, through slots in a six foot tall board. This mm -hmm. year it's sorting um, sorting balls and cubes. They're about two inches in diameter. The year before that it was stacking blocks and, the, and this is obviously on a large scale and so the, we we play this, we, and so basically you construct a robot, it's 18 inches by 18 inches is the maximum size, and then you will compete against four, against three other teams um, in a 12 foot by 12 foot um, playing field. And so, one of, and so just last year during the pandemic, it was a little weird, but we had that, um, we had the ring shooting competition, as I mentioned, and so even with that, we were able to do remote events and so it's really great every year you get to build on your previous learning, but it's also something new. And so it helps you stay engaged and it's not the same thing every year. And so I've, I've appreciated that. Awesome. Thanks for taking us on a, a little bit of a robot tangent there for a moment. Lorenzo, I'm hoping we can jump back to you in terms of this, this workload management. How long is it taking? What kind of sleep are you getting? How are you balancing this with other commitments that you have? Go right ahead. Yeah, so when it comes to the workload, I mean, I'm in 10th grade, there's a lot of work and it's not like, you know, there's no work and it's easy and all that, but there's there's a good amount of work. The thing I will say is, is that let's say you don't use your study halls or free periods, which are provided to help you finish all that work during the school day, which you can use. And if you use them to your best ability or use them at all, you'll get home, you'll have a bit of work, but it'll be notably less. Now, if you don't use those well, don't spend it like don't spend that time after school do it yes you can stay up late into the night but the school provides you with those tools to learn those skills for becoming better at managing your time and using that and then once you use those or when you apply those skills into the, your free periods you get home and you're like hey i have an hour of homework hey i have only 30 minutes and it could be more it could be less but for me as an example like it's 6 53 right now and i don't have any homework left for tomorrow because Today, I use my time in between middle bands, and then I use my free periods two days ago to really knock out the homework that I needed to do for today. So if it's well managed, there's definitely ways for you to be like well done and then balance all those other activities. Usually I would be in a sport right now, but I am injured, so I can't do that. But usually I would have practice for two to three hours a day, or I guess one and a half to two and a half hours a day. But then now it's been a lot easier because of that. But with a sport, it's totally manageable as well. You just have to use that time that's provided for you and the school definitely provides a lot of time with that now for the sleep question i would love to say that everyone is sleeping at 9 30 every day but again everyone makes choices and <laughs> it's just unrealistic for that but what i will say is based on the homework load you do not need to go to bed at like 11. there's you can go to bed quite a lot earlier and you can get all your work done before that now people make choices to not go to bed that early yes that's true i've made those choices at times yes i'll be honest but totally enough time in the day for you to finish even balance activities that you have and use that time during the day to go to bed at a very reasonable hour even in high school yeah all right great well you brought up a great term lorenzo which is choices and i'm hopeful that we can talk a little bit about some of the choices and options that we have in the curriculum because we've gotten a couple questions about uh, what are these required classes that students have to take for high school or for the program generally and then what are classes that um, any student can choose to take um, and then same thing 
just this question of, you know, kind of how do we have classes like orchestra, band, choir, drama, things like that. So I just want to give a, a little bit of context in terms of our high school graduation requirements specifically, because those are going to those are going to bridge from the requirements that we have in the middle school. So every middle schooler is going to have their literary thinking and historical thinking classes. They're going to have their um, scientific thinking class. They're going to have a mathematical foundations class or a math class that's going to be based on the appropriate level of challenge for them based on how they've done their foundational work within the program and then they're going to have Spanish language and beyond that we're going to have occasional requirements for students like our technology course progression so that's one trimester in each of the grades six seven and eight that they're doing in technology environmental practices they're going to have a trimester in grade seven and grade eight and then in addition to that, every student is doing some sort of creative expression or physical movement. Um, so Elena, will you help us with just some knowledge of how that looks practically in terms of what you've done for fine and performing arts classes and what you've done for either group PE or if you've done sports that are practiced during the day in grades five and six, what options you chose there? So just help root us in some examples of what students are doing in some of those optional areas. So last year, um, my focus was like theater, drama, that kind of stuff, um, which was taught by Miss Freistack. Um, she has really good acting skills, and um, I'm very thankful of her, and my acting skills are pretty good now. Um, so, um, like in class, we would like talk about stories, and like we would act out improv. Um, and read scripts like, well, I didn't take this class, but my friend told me and playing in Shakespeare, they would read Romeo and Juliet and then sometimes act that out. And then um, right now I'm taking band. So I'm playing the flute and um, in the first like two weeks, I could actually like make a sound mm -hmm. and I was pretty impressed by that. And then um, after one month I could like um, play like five notes in a row, I think. That was a big accomplishment. And then um, for PE class, um, last year I did three PE classes for all three trimesters. Um, and those are pretty fun. And we would play games and like do activities. And of course there was warm up at the start because you don't want to like pull your leg or anything. Um, Right. So, yeah, you would do a bunch of workouts, you will always get a sweat, and you must make sure you wear EPS shirts to PE class. Mm -hmm. An important requirement, we do have students dress out for PE, and you got to wear some sort of EPS gear. Uh, good note for future Eagles, so thank you for that, Elena. So as we're bridging from that middle school program into the upper school, we're going to maintain some of these courses that are going to be part of what we would consider to be some of these academic foundation areas. So uh, in the course progression, as they go through the upper school, they're going to have humanities paired courses. So literature and social science courses as they move through grades 9, 10, and 11, and then humanities options as they get into um, 12th grade. And then students are going to all have a three course science progression, biology, chemistry, physics in grades 9, 10, and 11 respectively. Students are going to do at least three years of math based on whatever course could be right for them. So a ninth grader could be in algebra one, they might be in geometry, they might be in algebra two, they might be in pre-calculus. So that's all going to be based on the right level of challenge for them. Similarly, Spanish language is going to be based on that right level of challenge. So we require that students do through Spanish three in our upper school and some students coming out of our middle school program are going to be placing into Spanish two. Um, some might be placing into Spanish three even just depending upon their level of skill with the program. So it's going to vary from student to student in terms of how they accomplish these graduation requirements, um, but they're going to have a ton of variety and choice beyond that. So Ms. Dodd, I know that you have been teaching some of these trimester electives in the upper school in our science program. So can you talk about kind of how trimester electives work broadly and then root us in some specific examples of what you've done in teaching those courses? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, in general, in the upper school, there are um, there are a lot of different trimester electives, right? And in, in all sorts of disciplines. So there are, you know, there's like creative writing classes, and there are kind of interdisciplinary classes that that might touch on, um, uh, yeah, well, multiple disciplines. Hence the name, right? <laughs> um, and then, you know, um, arts uh, offerings, right? And and the hope is that we really are creating these opportunities for our upper school students. Um, to to really explore topics that are of interest to them, right? So they're not just thinking about um, graduation requirements, although that's that's a plays a part in it, right? But they're also thinking about kind of what what are things I might be interested in, right? What are things I want to learn more about? And um, we were really excited um, a few years back is when we, um, as a science discipline, um, decided that we we'd had those year long courses. Um, that were talked about and then we had the advanced classes and James talked about um, advanced chemistry. We also have advanced biology and advanced physics, which are year long classes, but we felt like there was kind of a, a gap um, in terms of uh, what we were able to provide our students and we we were hearing and seeing um, just a, a a desire for for more classes right for more options and chances to learn about more things um, and so we developed um, five different trimester long electives that kind of connect to science in some way and um, I am super excited I get to teach two of them so I get to teach ecology and I get to teach marine biology and um, I just love these classes, right? They're they're so fun. They're they're very much kind of in my wheelhouse. That was um, I was a fisheries biologist before I became a teacher, so it's so fun to get to bring in kind of you know my my previous life in some ways um, into the classroom. And you know one thing that I really love about teaching these classes though is that we get a whole range of students in there, right? So we have some students who are saying I just want to take every science class I can, right? Like I just love science, and some of them are taking you know, lots of science classes in a trimester. Mm -hmm. But we also have students who were just like, oh, this sounded kind of cool. I don't know. I just wanted to learn more about this, right? And I think it's just such an amazing opportunity to be able to offer these classes um, at a high school level, right? Like I did not have a chance to study these topics um, in any sort of depth when I was in high school, right? Um, and so I think it's it's a great opportunity for them to get to learn different aspects. Like as I should mention, data science, geoscience, and astronomy are the other ones, the ones I don't teach. Um, but I think it's not only a great chance to to learn you know more about these topics, but also these are you know upper level science electives, and so there's also rigor in those. And I know when I think about my classes, I think about you know continuing that preparation of students for the college experience right so i think about you know the type of writing the type of labs the type of experiences that i had in my college science classes and and trying to kind of you know scale that down to a high school level but still start to to give them um some practice in um kind of approaching science in that way mm. so um, and, and it's just super fun yeah so i'm hearing a lot of threads there fun preparatory in a lot of ways, um, connected to what you did in your own work life prior to coming into the teaching realm. So um, so it just sounds like a really full experience and I'm grateful for you sharing it. And I know the students that I've talked with that have taken your classes have loved them. Um, Mr. Yu, can you talk to us about experience courses. Uh, so one of the things Katie mentioned was this interdisciplinary nature of some of these upper school electives. So um, can you root that in some experiences of your own? Yeah, I've had the, the good fortune to run a couple of classes that I designed with a colleague, Elena Olson. Uh, one was called Experience Seattle and one was called Experience Arches National Park. And uh, yeah, you get to experience both of those places. Um, those are place-based courses. We do a lot of um, study in terms of the history, the culture, um, the trends. You know, we talk about what can you learn specifically in Seattle you can't learn el elsewhere. What can you specifically learn in Arches National Park that you can't learn elsewhere? And then we've gone, we've gone to Arches twice. So the students have learned the geology and the culture and the history, and then they get to go see it and experience it and breathe it. And the same goes for our Seattle course. So it's it's taken on many iterations. Uh, when I first pitched the Seattle class, we had three Saturday field trips, one to downtown Seattle, one out to Bainbridge to the Suquamish Nation, and then a hike uh, out at uh, Cougar Mountain um, to look at some history out there. So. You know, to the degree we can, 
whether it's a course called Experience Seattle or if it's, you know, Katie's uh, egg osmosis lab, having kids do things. The question we ask ourselves as we're thinking about our teaching is what are the kids doing? Awesome. Well, I appreciate that, Sam. What students would you share? Um, Lorenzo and James are both unmuted, so willing to share some other elective experiences. So James, go ahead and talk about some other things that you've done in terms of elective options. One thing I should note is that every student will do five trimesters of arts courses as part of their graduation distribution requirements in the upper school. So go ahead, James. Yeah, so I think I've very much enjoyed and tried to take advantage of the elective offerings at EPS. Last year, I took two electives that I think are quite unique to EPS and that were very interesting to me. So those two were undercover economics and urban planning. And so those were both great classes, both taught by um, Mr. Delaney, who is the academic dean. And he was, he, was a, uh, he was a great teacher of both subjects and he was quite passionate and interested in them. Um, and so economics, that was all looking at markets and how they work and how the economics of our world and global trade works. And so that was that was a great lens to observe that from. And then the other one was urban planning. And that was a great class for the final project. What we were able to do is we were able to re redesign a part of Seattle that we thought could be redesigned. Um, and what I did with my partner is there's a game called City Skylines. And basically it's it's a realistic city um, city builder. And so we were able to reconstruct this part of Seattle in 3D and make it function. And that was really awesome. And Mr. Delaney was quite open and receptive to us doing it with this medium. And I thought that that was a good, I, th I thought that it was a good demonstrator of the EPS experience and how teachers are always looking to do something new and try something and how they're very open-minded. And so I, I thought that that was really great. And those were two awesome electives that I took. Yeah. Wonderful. And Lorenzo, what would you share from the elective side? Yeah, so I'm going to dive into specifically one elective that I'm taking right now, which is physical meets digital. So it's a tech course, which is mixed with the, I mean, it's in the name, physical aspect, which at first I was like, OK, is it going to be an art class where we paint stuff maybe online, and then it's art. And then I come to find it's a coding circuit, uh, laser cutting, 3D printing class. And I'm like, wow, OK, not what I was expected. And right away I was like, oh, God, what's this going to be? And then I, it turns out, OK, I really enjoy it. Great. It's one of these many courses in ESET prep that's really fun. And even if you don't plan to take it, which was my case, which the curriculum, I'm still really enjoying it right now. And I'm enjoying every class that I have. And then one specific example from that is a uh, we're doing circuit designing and it involves making the circuit, connecting it with an Arduino to your computer. So there's the coding aspect. And then we're also uh, laser cutting a uh, the pieces that we need to build on. One ex like an example, me and my friend Rami are trying to make a prototype for a lunch line monitor because with COVID going on, we have social distancing, which is becoming an issue. You know, there's so many kids. But one way we're thinking of solving it is putting a 3D printed or laser cut stand near the launch line that has uh, circuit activated lights that will pop up when there's uh, too many people in one area or two people next to each other. Not like, you know, right next to each other, but it's based on trying to keep that space. So that's one way we're trying to help the community too with this class. And just wanted to answer one of the questions that's related to this in the chat. That is, how is tech used in the classroom? So. One thing that my parents are always telling me is, oh, there's so much screen time and you got to get outside and all that. But I'd like, I just wanted to uh, talk about quickly, like, although the stuff that we use to submit and turn in our assignments is on the computer, a lot of the projects we have are on paper or on reading assignments, which is really fun. Like in literature, we're always having a book throughout all sections of our trimester, which we're reading. So that takes you away from the screens. And then during the day, we're not really on the screens all the time. Like there's a lot of activities and interactive stuff. So although it's the main thing for how we submit assignments, there's a really good balance that keeps you away from just staring at a screen all day. So it's really not like that intense with the screen time. Awesome, super helpful example. And, and I loved hearing too about how 
yeah, physical meets digital. Was it exactly or digital? You know, like, w was this exactly what you thought you were getting into? No, you you had some surprise factor there, even with the course catalog at your disposal. Um, but then rolling with that and seeing what are some of the great things that you could learn from that. Um, Miss Hale, go right ahead. I want to layer on top of what Lorenzo was saying about like a good balance between screen time and not screen time. Um, because today I actually had a plan where we were going to do some work on the computer um, and students were engaging so kind of deeply in the discussion aspect of this rubric creation. Um, I actually just had everyone put the computers away. Um, so we, I mean, I would show kind of the things that I wanted to, to like look at up on this up on the projector. Um, but a lot of the times I actually was turning the screen off and actually making sure that they were focused on the discussion within um, their small groups and they were like looking at other rubrics that teachers had created um, and trying to decide if those were aspects they wanted to pull um, and maybe critiquing and, and kind of also like trying to find uh, the helpful aspects of some of these things. So it was nice to see that even though I had an online activity, um, they actually were craving um, just a little space to talk. Um, and, and sometimes we need to be online to get things done and, and, and publish, and sometimes we can do what we did today and just kind of shut it all down and, and just have a big discussion. Mm -hmm. My apologies. Yeah, I appreciate that. <clears throat> One thing I'll mention too, in addition to that, is with our Common Laptop program, Everyone is on the same tablet PC model at EPS. We have uh, the organizational tools that come with our laptop. So all the software that's loaded on there is our full Microsoft suite. We use Teams um, you know, in remote school. Of course, we use them for these types of meetings uh, or more of a Teams meeting format than a Teams live format, I should say, as well as Teams chat. Teams chat continues to be a tool that we're using um, as well as an organization space, uh, the, the various teams that we can create within teams. Um, Canvas is our learning management system. And so that learning management system allows us to be able to have a variety of different ways of communicating what is happening over the course of a class as well as for specific days, specific assignments. Um, that is often the mechanism through which students will turn in their assignments at EPS. And, uh, and that functions as a grade book as well. And so when it comes to just some of these different tools, those are the common platforms that everyone's using. And then a lot of what will be used in classes like the ones Lorenzo was mentioning um, will be a whole suite of digital tools that can be loaded onto student laptops as well. And so that whole Adobe Creative Suite is gonna be something that's really practical and useful, lots of different uh, programming applications and students have administrative rights to their laptops so they can add programs as needed for different things that they might be working on on both pertaining to school um, as well as just for um, for their own interests and pursuits. So just wanted to add that specifically. With some questions around supporting different types of students um, and different types of learners. And Lorenzo touched on this earlier, just how lots of different types of students are incorporated into the education at EPS. But Mr. Yu, I'm hoping you can kick us off just in terms of this idea of how accommodations fit into an academic program at EPS um, or how support fits into an academic program at EPS. How do we structure that here? Maybe how is that different from the way that other schools might structure it? Um, and you know, what, what types of programs do we have in place? I think the most important uh, piece about this is that learning support is core to our entire school. Everyone at some point is going to need some form of support or another, be it well-being support, academic support. And what I'm really proud of in terms of our learning support group and the culture of our school is that uh, this is not a siloed separate program. Learning support is alive across the school. We have universal interventions in terms of how we teach, in terms of what we offer students, because oftentimes, you know, what's good teaching for students with learning differences is good teaching for all students. Mm -hmm. The school was founded to be intentionally neurodiverse. We have a ton of learner variability because that reflects the real world that our students will be journeying into. And when you put a diverse array of people together and they feel included in the place, it, it's magical. So very specifically, um, our learning support folks work directly with our classroom teachers on professional development days to talk about strategies. Our learning support area is open to all students and we'll receive emails over the weekend. Hey, 
I'm having a tough time with this from a student who doesn't have a learning plan or doesn't have accommodations and they're looking for some support and some help. We have learning, we'll sit down with families who do have diagnosed learning differences and have had accommodations in the past and we'll develop a learning plan. We'll talk through how we do that here and we'll make sure that information is shared with the broader faculty. So I think it's really core to uh, who we are. Awesome, really appreciate that. And specifically to the piece about um, there's a, a specific um, mention of twice exceptional. We've got a variety of different diagnoses that would be included um, in terms of our learners and their learner profiles coming into EPS. Um, and there's lots of different ways that we're accommodating students. But is there anything that you would want to add on that front, um, Sam, just in terms of either you know specific diagnoses or, or twice exceptional students in particular? Well, for twice exceptional students in particular, you know, uh, all of the students have mentioned, you know, the the challenge that is found in our classes, the 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 rigor as expressed by depth of material and complexity of material and relevance of material. When you combine that with support for learning differences like dys dyslexia, dysgraphia, ADHD, through our approach to learner variability, that means that for a twice exceptional student, they're getting what they need in both ways, the stretch of the academics, the support to show what they know. Awesome, really help, helpful for you to put that finer point on it and just to know that yes, we're meeting the needs of students in a variety of ways, that challenge and support, and that's gonna come through in a lot of different senses. Alicia, what would you like to add? Um, this is an example just from today where I was asking students, I was like, they they made student generated study guides um, and the goal that I asked them to the challenge I gave them was how can you make the study guide different than others or um, how can you make the study guide of your dreams right where it's somehow more engaging than anything you have used before um, and the solutions were actually super duper creative and when I was asking them to create these rubrics I was like okay well how do we score something everyone created something different it's all a chapter 7 study guide but they're all different study guides. How do we score them? And students were really talking about how different study guides actually engage different types of learners. And the awareness of these seventh graders of the needs of others learning was, it was almost immediate. They're like, well, why don't we give the kids like three different choices? They could pick three, they could have three different study guides they could choose from. And then, then they get to pick their learning style from the study guides that we made. I was like, well, that's brilliant, um, you know, and it was just that the idea that they had already they already were thinking like that and they think about each other and they openly talk about the needs of others um, in the classroom. They know it's a supportive environment. They know it's a safe environment to talk about something. And I'm dyslexic. I talk about being dyslexic consistently. Um, so the idea of like it is a safe space to talk about um, those neurodiverse spaces and the needs that you might have. Um, it was really, it was really fantastic to watch them kind of support each other and um, that's normalized. I appreciate you sharing that, Alicia, and I think one thing that I hear a lot from our students is that when the adults in the community are able to share the ways that their brain works, whether that has a diagnosis or not that is attached to it, that it just normalizes that experience of knowing. Uh, like when I say to a student, hey, that's super important. I really appreciate what you just said. I'm going to take some time to write it down so that I can remember to follow up with you or so that I can remember um, what you wanted to share with me here because that's how my brain will best uh, take in that information. I know that that's something that is a, just a, a really important thing for us to create just those those culture and, and norm uh, values around the, those pieces. Lorenzo, what would you like to add? Uh, well, there's a comment in the chat that kind of relates to what we're talking about, which is mm -hmm. related to the homework load and how the materials are taught depending on the teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, one prime example of this would probably be again today. So across a class we have two classrooms separated by low hallway and the teachers are often going back and forth just talking like about what plans are going to be and between both classes there's very different experiences based on how it's taught now the content might be the same but you get different personalities with these teachers and how they teach it so for one class you might have a teacher who goes about a topic differently and for another you might have one again differently that would be Again, the same contents being taught, but I think the most 
rewarding part of that is you really get to make that connection with the people in your class because although the course material is the same, it's a different environment and a learning environment. And often what I've seen is, is that those splits in classes work out very well for those people in those classes. I don't know necessarily how it's split or if it's split to cater to certain people's personalities and how it's fit, but it's always felt like a really fluid and it works really well in that classroom environment. So the homework load doesn't change. Like a teacher won't like be like, oh, assign 20 more assignments than the other one. There might be one or two that they assign just because they feel like that's necessary for their class. But the, the, the environment that's built around a teacher in a class and the students in that class varies based on the personalities in that class. Not necessarily just on the teacher's personality, but how they all blend together. Nice. And Mr. Yu, do you want to just chime in from scheduling island on how those <laughs> those uh, groups of students are devised when we're looking at these, for example, humanities courses where we're going to have different sections that are meeting at the same time? Yeah, I will say I've <laughs> I've been in charge of schedules at. Oh, I guess three different schools and the amount of choice and the customization of our schedule is um is pretty complex uh, i think it's one of the hallmarks particularly in the upper school of our program is students being able to choose um their their lit classes and their history classes right off the bat in ninth grade there's two choices each term uh and so you know we we work hard to get students their choices in their lit and history classes make sure they have the proper placement in math and spanish and then get them those electives and it's an iterative process uh, and we, we we take it pretty seriously and and uh, students are great about it. You know, they'll work with us uh, to craft that schedule and make sure it's the experience they want. Yeah, and along those lines, we have this question of how much do students influence the electives and the clubs that are available to take or that they get involved in, um, you know, and that they get to know about like how how much student voice matters in that process of what we decide to offer both within the course catalog and in the co-curriculum in these out of class experiences as well. Certainly the most agency is found within our activities and clubs. And in fact, we have starting in the middle school, a process by which if there's an interest, students can ask to have a club created by getting some friends together and looking for a mentor. Uh, and then on a trimester by trimester basis, we'll make it happen. And the same goes in the upper school. Uh, we have a bunch of clubs that have been around for a while, but we have new clubs uh, in both divisions that come about um, based on student interest. We have a, a study buddy club being formed in the middle school right now. We have a, gra a kindness club in the sixth grade that was the, the work of one of our sixth graders, and we're rallying support around her for those efforts. Um, when it comes to the courses, we have, you know, it, the, it, the school puts together uh, what the offerings are uh, based on staffing and based on a rotation to make sure that as a student moves to the upper school in particular, they're able to access all those electives. Um, however, when it comes after that portion, you know, uh, we really see uh, we, we based it on student interest. So for the urban planning class James was in, I got to teach another section last year because the capacity su surpassed one section of 18. We have a hard board mandated cap at 18 students in each class. And so we were able to spin up another section and offer two sections that year. So uh, there's definitely, we're definitely responsive to the student interests uh, year by year. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I, I recognize what a complex effort it is <laughs> that our uh, school leaders work on each year uh, in tangent with a whole variety of people to make scheduling happen. So thank you for all of those efforts. Um, I want to end with the final question that we just had come into the chat because I think we've talked a lot about some of the things that we really love about EPS, value about EPS. One of the things that I love and value about EPS is our commitment to our mission. And part of that is to innovate wisely. And so part of innovation is trying things out um, and seeing what sticks. And sometimes we don't 
always get it 100% right. We have to tune it a little bit or we have to um, retire some, some older concepts or ideas or practices in order to move forward for the benefit of student learning, student belonging, student well-being. So, um, so the question has come in for the students, what would you like to see change at EPS? But this is something that I want to really pose to everyone um, as we're as we're moving forward, because I think that change, you know, having a commitment to change is rooted in knowing what your experiences are now and, and what you want to do with them or what you would like to see the school do with them. Um, so Elena, what would you like to see change at EPS? If you had something that could be different at school, what would you say that that should be? Um, that's a hard question. Um, <laughs> Um, can you come back to me? I need yeah, it. let's come back to you. Let's go to uh, Lorenzo or James first. Whoever unmutes first can just start sharing. Go ahead, James. So I think this is obviously, uh, this is quite a difficult um, question. I, there are many things that I love about EPS, but I think the one thing that I would change is the current way that um, the that the lunch is done. I think that the, the lunch is awesome. The lunch it tastes really good. It's always you know it's always enough food. But I think the one thing that I would change is the offerings, and I would just have like more offerings per day. But whenever but whenever there is whenever there is something the the one daily offering or the vegetarian option, it's always pretty darn good. Awesome. And James, it sounds like Lorenzo might already be working on some sort of wise innovation for at least the, the lunch distribution process. So um, so Lorenzo, you should uh, you should definitely sidebar with James about some of his thoughts on that. Um, Lorenzo, what would you share in terms of something you would change about EPS? You've had a number of years of experience here. What would you add? Well, this might be something I not, might not want to change right now, but it's something that I did want to change, which I think is super Cool to see because you can see that our community is like a growth and change friendly place like we accept that growth and change and we adapt to it we don't uh keep anyone's opinions back we uh allow all those opinions to be heard by many surveys and uh, during assemblies that we send out through various different concepts so one example would be a while ago i was concerned at the level in which we were competing in sports and mm -hmm. that was my first concern a while ago. But now, I mean, just a little shout out to the Eastside Prep Frisbee boys varsity. They're going to the state championship on Sunday. So that's an example of like, back then I was like, okay, are we really being challenged? But now you have the girls volleyball playing, I think right now against Bush in the playoffs. So you like, now we've really stepped up to also like a sports place from academic level. Now our sports uh, have really stepped up as well. So. I wouldn't change anything right now. I can't think of anything I would change, but something that I did want to change has been effectively changed in that way, which really, I mean, it, it shows that we accept that change and bring it and try to change as much as we can. And I think about all the different elements that are part of that change. A lot of it is participation. So we have over 50% of our students participating in fall sports this year, for example, and just the engagement and the commitment to that. Um, we're continually committed to our no cut sports philosophy and I think that that's a huge part of even as we grow and you know the rosters grow and the program grows we really want it to be an accessible piece to students um, but yeah as, as we as we continue to grow and develop the program and really commit to great coaching and great experiences for students it, we are experiencing some of that objective success um, in terms of state uh, play, playoffs for state championships and things like that which is pretty fun um, I will kick it over to our faculty, Katie, Alicia, what would you share in terms of something that you'd like to see change at EPS? Okay, I guess I can go first. It's a hard question um, because again, I think there's, um, you know, because I, I do really like it here. Um, and I think it kind of building off of the point that Lorenzo made, um, I think there are, um, you know, 
one of the things that I really value about EPS is that we're not afraid of that change, right? Um, that we we embrace new challenges and we, I think as a faculty and as a student body, honestly, are, are really adaptable, right? And we kind of find ways to make things work. And so I think overall, like um, our, our kind of, yeah, our, our philosophy about that is is a great one, right? That, that, that change is not something to be feared. Um, one area that I think, um, I do feel that we've we've been making progress and that I'm that I I feel great about. Um, but I think there's still there's still room to grow is kind of our continued um, understanding kind of in this landscape in terms of um, equity and in terms of inclusion and how we can continue to um, make EPS a space where every single student um, can be their authentic self, you know, in in the, all the time. Right. And mm -hmm. again, I don't mean to suggest that that we don't have that already, right? But I just think there's always room for us to grow in that respect, right? Mm -hmm. And for us to kind of learn and step up and just kind of consider, you know, it's kind of that student well-being piece, right? How are we supporting our students? Um, what are things, where, what are supports that they might need that we hadn't realized, right? We hadn't anticipated, um, you know, whether that's related to belonging or overall well-being. So those kind of stand out to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think when a school community is, is genuinely engaging in that, um, hard look at, you know, is every student experiencing belonging, then we know there's always going to be more work to do um, to create that truly inclusive community. Alicia, what would you add to that? I mean, I think layering on to what Katie is saying is that working on that um, idea of student involvement in that change too, and encouraging students to really own and be, and be part of that um, development with us. And I think that's the thing that um, I really value. Having taught in public school for 10 years um, and then come to EPS, I really, I really value the um, openness of students and the willingness of students to be like, hey, this, I didn't see this in your curriculum and um, I'd love to see it and we should, uh, can we sit down and talk about it? And, and the fact that students are asking like, hey, let's sit down and talk about change and, and how things are missing and, and what or what can we add and how can we help other students. Um, I really love the amount of care students give to each other and I want to see that kind of develop more. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think that just the idea of like encouraging and developing the idea of, of activism within the curriculum and activism within the school um, and even developing and pushing that outside of the school um, and that every student can and find a way to make a better world um, and through that. I think, sorry, it got a little confusing, but. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a helpful set of um, just thoughts that you've shared around what we're doing, how students are engaged in that, how we can continue to engage them more in that work because we value that they are, they're coming to us with a lot of that care and compassion. We, we really want to capitalize on that. Um, Elena, I just want to loop back to you if you thought of anything that you want to add to this question before we say goodbye. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so I would change like, let's say lunchtime. Lunchtime, I would say is a bit too long. It's like I finish lunch and then I don't really have anything to do because you can't open up your computers. You can't really like do stuff with it and then like you can only talk to I mean like I care about my friends but like it's like I guess too long because we have like 15 minutes of passing period already for class so we don't really need like that much time to like talk with our friends and then we have clubs right after or advisory which makes us like interact even more and that is something I would like change to like make lunch a bit shorter um, and most importantly, the biggest change ever is to give Mr. Yu a bigger office. <laughs> I love this, Elena. So Elena is advocating for shorter lunches because as you mentioned, lunch is a tech free time. So it's really geared towards conversation, sharing. Um, and yeah, if students don't want to pop out onto the sport court, for example, to play after lunch, it might feel like a long lunch period. 35 minutes could feel like a long time. I know as a slow adult eater, I personally feel like it's never enough time. But Mr. Yu, do you want to just uh, close us out this evening with your thoughts on Elena's proposal for a larger office for you? Uh, <laughs> Elena, I appreciate you looking after me. 
uh, as in my as I'm in my, our my temporary quarters while we are remodeling our middle school. So I think there's something a little bit larger on the horizon. But thanks for looking after me, kiddo. <laughs> Any other remarks that you want to share in addition to office size uh, before we go, <laughs> Mr. Hughes-Wack? No, just to thank everyone for, you know, for taking the time to learn about our school. I mean, I I hope that our students and faculty have, you know, have really left you, you, you with uh, an impression of the most important thing to me, which is just the community that we're building and continuing to build. Uh, and it's a place where I can rely on people to help me be my best and I try to help them be their best. And I've just been really impressed, you know, uh, Lorenzo and James came through our middle school and now they're doing amazing things in our upper school. Uh, uh, Elena, you keep me on my toes and I appreciate that. And Katie and Alicia are key contributors to our middle school planning and our, um, and our way of being. And I just appreciate you all. Well, I appreciate you all in total, including you, Mr. Uswak, um, as well as Meg Blyler for producing our event tonight. Thank you all so much for participating, our attendees. It is really through your questions and your enthusiasm around getting to know the Eastside Prep community that we host these events with uh, lots of care and energy. And so we appreciate you, uh, whether you've been viewing this live or whether you're viewing this asynchronously, taking the time to invest in getting to know EPS. And we're excited to get to know you better as you move through this process. So thanks everyone so much and have a great evening.